Uh, Romans chapter 8 says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For creation waits an eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject, subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope, that the, in hope that the creation itself would be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This is the word of the Lord. That was a really poor bit. Sit down, guys. That was uh, probably one of the weakest thanks be to gods I've ever heard. But <laughs> we've gone through a tough couple of weeks, so there's grace for you in that. Uh, this morning, I just want to. I've been praying so much over the last week, especially uh, about what God is doing through all of this crazy stuff we're experiencing. And, and this morning, I want to share some reflections uh, about some of the things I sense the Lord is doing. In 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32, it talks about these people called the men of Issachar who understood the time and knew what to do. Um, and so I see a big part of my role as a pastor is really just trying to discern what God is doing through different seasons. And, and we do that because we want to bless what God's doing. We don't want to just come up with plans and say, God, would you bless our plans? We want to see what God is doing and bless that. And that's what Jesus did in John 5, 19, which is one of the core scriptures for the vineyard. Jesus is like, man, I don't, I don't do whatever I want to do. I just do what I see my father doing. That's why it's, such a, it's so important to have that life of prayer. And so Jesus was just like, Father, what are you doing that we can bless it? And so there have been some major disruptions in our lives in the last few weeks, two of them, not just one. We've had the cyclone, but there's been another thing going on that's, that's uh, equally important, and, and uh, I want to speak to that this morning. The first is obviously the cyclone, um, and this is something that's really important for us as a church to kind of really just go, like, Lord, what are you doing through this disruption? If Romans 8 is true, that you work for good through all things, then what are you doing through this crazy situation? But the second thing, disruption or major event that's been happening in the, in the world at the moment has been a revival or an awakening or an outpouring of God's spirit or whatever you want to call it in a university called Asbury. And it's been a movement among Generation Z, so under 25s. Um, and uh, this is really important for our church as well. So it's not just been... One thing, there's been two big things going on the last couple of weeks. The Asbury thing's the first time in the last 30 years there's been some sort of outpouring of God's Spirit in this sort of way. So this isn't a small thing. And if you're not clued up to, you know, up to speed with what that is, I'm going to unpack a little bit today. Um, but to frame this up, I want to quickly unpack a few key concepts from Romans 8, the passage that we just uh, engaged with. And what I'm going to do is in the sermon notes uh, on the podcast, I'm going to link, and I'll stick this on our private page, I'm going to link to an article that Steve Graham wrote. Now, Steve Graham's a friend of our church, brilliant mind, uh, an article that he wrote after the Christchurch earthquakes, which is what I'm drawing from on some of this stuff. Very helpful uh, in terms of getting your bearings theologically as you navigate through this. Um, but it's interesting in that Romans 8 scripture that uh, there's, uh, there's three different groanings that's going on in the scripture. Uh, creation is groaning, we are groaning, and the Spirit is groaning in intercession for us. That's a good word, groan, eh? Don't you reckon that's pretty apt for like at the moment, the bay? The, uh, uh, <laughs> groan. What a great word. Just perfect. It's not even a word, it's a sound, you know? And uh, so you've got like creation groaning. Uh, this isn't right. This isn't the way it's meant to be. This is broken. And then you've got people groaning. 
And then you've got the spirit groaning in intercession for us. It's interesting that Paul is like basically saying the sign of the spirit, get this guys, the sign that the Holy Spirit's in your life is not some superficial triumphalism, but a deep groaning and frustration at the brokenness and pain of the world. Who's feeling it? You know? <laughs> but then he says in Romans 8 verse 28, which is a passage we know really well because we've quoted it at nause- ad nauseum <laughs> when life gets tricky, but it's so beautifully true. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been, calling a- who've been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. This is what Steve Graham says about this particular verse. This is not a, and this is again written after the Christchurch earthquakes. So the Christchurch earthquakes were like the cyclone, but the whole city was munted. We've kind of got a functioning city center. So this was like, this was at a time that was feeling very similar to this time, and, and you could argue even more tricky. So he writes this, says, this particular verse is not a silly affirmation that God has willed all things. It's not that God works all things, that's a mistranslation and an abomination, but that God works in all things. Super important we get that. So where is God at work in all things? Paul focuses on a mystery. There are bad things, but God is somehow at work, even within evil, to bring good. Unless we be too flippant about this good, the shallow culturally defined definitions of good, which comfort, ease, blessing, Paul defines the good. In the events of God is at, uh, in, in the events God is at work seeking to transform His people a little bit more into the image of God. So that's the that's the goal. That's the good. He wants to transform us so that the the song we just sung that we want to become a little bit more like Him is answered. And oh, sorry, let me finish reading. Sorry, Harvey's getting warmed up already. That the church might look a little bit more Jesus, like Jesus at the end of this horrible thing. That out of the rubble of suffering, the church would emerge a little bit more as the glorious thing God had in mind, a bearer of the heart and character of Jesus. The dean of the cathedral, Peter Beck, famously said of the earthquake, the earthquake was not an act of God. It was the earth doing what the earth does. For me as a Christian, the act of God is in the love and compassion that people are sharing among each other. As I've reread Paul, Steve's arguing, and as I will show soon with Jesus, which is the article you can read if you want, you know what? I think that's actually the message of Romans 8. So uh, I've said this in the past. I think I may even have said it at the beginning of this year, prophetically, unbeknownst to me. But what is a great accelerator for the work of God in terms of forming us into the image of God? It's suffering. It's disruption. It's pain. There's something in that that's an intersection of invitation to God to get more transformed, to allow him to work uh, in us in a way that is just truly beautiful. So, so God's at work wanting to form us, but he's also at work. Been, he's been working through the people all over this region and all over this country where there's been an outpouring of love and servant-hearted action. It's funny how there's something in us. Like whether you believe in Jesus or not, there's something in us that's been like, I've got to get out there and help, man. I'm going to unpack that in a minute. So we're part of this bigger story, a story of a good God who works for good through all things. But there's something significant getting shaped right now out of the cyclone and what is happening in Asbury. And I want to give some observations about what I think it is as I've been praying throughout the week. So let's start with the cyclone. What's God been doing uh, that's, that's, I think, important for us as a church? Well, the first thing is I think he's um, rem- maybe reawakening or, or amplifying or helping us just love this land. It's like, you know, I was so moved a number of um, weeks ago on our Waitangi weekend service when Beth Tikiri, um, just as behalf of the, on behalf of the Tangata Whenua, the Māori people in this land, welcomed particularly those that have immigrated here and, and spoke so empathetically of what it's like to leave land and to come to a foreign land and make it your home. And in a sense, it's like many Pākehā New Zealand struggle to, to see, have that sort of deep connection to the land um, because we've immigrated here. But there's something that, uh, that is a gift of our bicultural country, but it's also there's a gift here in the cyclone of just making us realise we love this place. I love this place. Like we moved here from Christchurch, thank you, Jesus. You know, God bless I mean, again, I don't know. My mates have been like, bro, wherever you move next, we're not moving there, bro, because like... <laughs> But a lot of that, I think, was in preparation because me and Jen's destiny is now tied up in this region. 
And it was in preparation for what the Lord wants to do uh, in, our, uh, you know, in our church at this time. And through this, it's like, man, you just see the devastation to the land. You're like, this is horrible. And like, what can we do to repair the land? Like, there's a love to this land that is, is flourishing, and that's a God thing. Let it happen. We're, we're here to love this place. Do I have a dualistic thing? Like where it's like, that's not spiritual. It's like, no, from the beginning of the Bible, God's people were called to steward and care for the land. So that's, in, that's deep in your DNA. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that there's been this strong urge, like I mentioned before, to care and to help. It's like there's needs all around us. And what can we do to play our part? And uh, again, I don't know about you, but it's like, um, part of me is like, man, this is the way it should feel. Like, you know, this is obviously, there's this kind of intensity to it right now. But I'm like, like we're seeing the best of humanity. Where it's like, man, you've got needs, let me help you out. And like, I, I, we're literally, on the, I don't know where to put volunteers anymore. Apart from tomorrow morning at 9.30. And it's like, <laughs> like, man, we have more help. than. And same where we live out in Bayview at the King George Hall, often normally overwhelmed with volunteers and struggling to, you know, and all that sort of stuff. It's like there's been this outpouring of like, man. And here's the thing. There's something deeply fulfilling about blessing others and giving your life away. And that's exactly what Jesus wants us to live full time. Like actually what we're experiencing in terms of the stirring up to go and help and serve is actually just the kingdom of God that's in you. Like we, you, are, you are hardwired to be bringers of God's kingdom. What's God's kingdom? Everything good, everything beautiful, everything healing, everything that brings wholeness, everything that restores, that's God's kingdom. And so like helping people out right now is just like it's coming from this urge that every single one of us have to be agents of God's kingdom. And so um, what my prayer is through this is that we wouldn't just go, oh, yeah, this is just a burst. But, but for, as a church, certainly we go, no, we want to live this even more. The needs aren't going to go away in a year's time. And if you're wondering, like, you know, if people are doing okay, have a chat to Cherie or Andre or Bruce and Marley. Whatever. It's like, find out what's ha- what, where the brokenness is in this city and in this region. And then our job as a church is go, how can we bless? How can we restore? How can we bring good? How can we bring hope? How can we bring healing? That's what the kingdom's all about. But here's the thing. The kingdom doesn't move forward unless people sacrifice. And so the currency of the kingdom is passion. Like you've got to get passionate about the kingdom. And what does passion look like? Passion is whatever you give something else up for to give to that. Money, time. Like, and, and, you know, the thing that is ripping my undies right now in terms of the church in New Zealand is that there's no pastors coming through. And there's no missionaries going overseas anymore. And there's no people vo- like deciding to set up MGO. There's so few leaders coming through that are prepared to give their lives away for the kingdom. And so I'm unashamedly standing here before you saying we need you for the kingdom of God. It can't be a handful of people that choose to give their lives to the kingdom. The church is meant to give its life to see the kingdom come. And so I don't know what that looks like for you, but I'm asking you in this moment of disruption to consider the trajectory of your life and maybe wreck it for Jesus. Go to Bible college. Do something that reflects a passion that's not just theory, but that's there in your hearts to build the kingdom of God. It's the most satisfying, fulfilling way you can live. But friends, we have a leadership crisis in this country when it comes to the kingdom. And so I'm like, just, I'm like, there's something happening here where people are like just choosing to give and serve and do all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, let's live like that for the rest of our lives, for the rest of our days until we see him face to face. Oh, he's warmed up. Came here, everybody, bros. Lastly, uh, what's been quite cool is people giving a lot of money. So what's happening during this thing is they've been, so now at the beginning of the year, we pray, uh, our team prays, our core guys. It's like, you know, Lord, what do you want to do in the year? Steve Bradley felt um, the word for the year for us was acceleration. And I'm like, yeah, cool. I've been around Pentecostal charismatic circles for a long time. I was like, great, let it be, Lord. (laughs) Now I'm like, oh, crikey, (laughs) maybe not. (laughs) No, no joke, it's all good, God, you can keep doing it. But it's like, you know, that word came through and we're like, oh, what does that even mean? What does that look like? And then like this happens and like we've been given thousands of dollars as a church, tens of thousands of dollars as a church to help with the cyclone stuff, uh, which is awesome. So we can give financial gifts to people that have been really affected by it. 
um, but also we're like we've got money enough money that we can strategically go what can we do in terms of minister you know ministries and stuff so one of the things that we're working on and uh, again the thing with acceleration is you have to make decisions quickly um, and you've just got to keep on it right it's not it's like when you're accelerating things get quicker mm, right so it's like I'm it's like I'm starting to realize all this uh, <laughs> And so one of the things that we're thinking about doing is going, one of the big needs moving forward is housing. And so it's like, well, how can we play our part in that? And so one of the ideas that we've got at the moment is that we're going to, looking at employing someone for like a four-month contract, two days a week, uh, to, to co kind of coordinate things. Because some people are like, yeah, we've got some housing, short-term, long-term, respite, what do you, you know? Uh, and, then it's like, and then where are the needs that could fit with that? So we're like, what if we work together with the churches? I've got a meeting tomorrow about this with the pastors in the city. And, and we went... How about, and we're, Bava you know, is going to just help underwrite all this because we've got the cash coming in. How about we employ someone to go, hey, we're going to work out where all that housing may be, get some organisation around it, and then get some key contacts that can help us connect families that need that sort of housing. So it's not really happening at the moment. And I'm like, we can just start making those decisions because things are starting to accelerate a little bit because of finance. And, uh, and when it comes to the things of God's kingdom, like that's, that helps so I'm like, would you continue to be generous to our church? Because in your generosity means that we can put the foot down on the gas pedal a little bit more in terms of the kingdom dreams that are on our hearts, right? So, man, we can employ people, key people, great leaders who can help us get these kingdom things going. So this is what's been uh, happening for us. Parallel to that, so you've got all that that's happening, and I'm like, God's working for good. This is my read so far around what the Lord's doing. And I say all this because there's been a little bit of like nervousness, not nervousness, I've been like, the danger in this time is that we get so caught up in doing all the stuff in crisis that we lose sight of God and His kingdom. So this is why I did the email, please come to church this week. Because <laughs> I'm like, we've got to have eyes to see what God's doing through this and bless it. So that's so you've got the, the cyclone thing happening. Parallel to this, you've got this whole thing in, in, happening over in this Christian university in the States called Asbury University, uh, with a college. You know how they call it college? So annoying because it's so confusing. Because I went to college and then it's, you know, when it, it's the end of seventh form. Um, I, I went to, to, you know, uh, to Bible college. But um, anyway, they call it college, university. So this, these kids at a Christian university in Wilmore, Kentucky, because it's a Christian university, three times in the semester they have to go to a chapel. So now across the road from the university is a seminary. It's a Bible college. And at that Bible college are friggin' ninjas, man, like in terms of like the scholars and stuff that are there, are big dogs, okay? I know a bunch of them got their books on my wall, all the rest of it. Now, in the seminary, everyone's hard out for Jesus. In the Christian university, yeah, so-so, right, as you'd imagine. They have to go to chapel, Three times a week, uh, three times in the sorry in the semester for, to get the credits, they have to turn up. <laughs> so they have this chapel service. The guy, a guy, preaches a message that, by his own admission, was pretty average. He's, and and one of the guys, Pete Greg, asked him why. He said, "I'm a bit lazy, and I regret it now." <laughs> but he has a message. He texts his wife, "Coming home now." That was just the, after the latest stinker. I think is what he said. Jen's had that occasional text as well, and. Uh, and so he does this chapel, they do this chapel, blah, 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 and then a few kids at the end, can I go to the next slide? On the left-hand side, this is at the end of that chapel service, a few kids hanging around praying. God's spirit just turns up in that chapel. And like, this is where it's totally sovereign. Like, kids just started coming back to the chapel. And like, and a few hours later, this is what it was like, no plan, no like, it was just this thing of God's Holy Spirit. And so I want to play you a two-minute clip from one of the things that's incredible about this move of God is how it's been led. No celebrities. Thank you, Jesus. No Christian celebrities, but led very strongly and very wisely and very humbly. So this is one of the guys that's involved in leadership. Mainly, they've just been putting the kids up on the stage, but then occasionally one of the leaders will say something. I don't even know this guy's name. They choose not to put his name on the thing on purpose. I love it. He's, now, this, is at, this happened two days ago on Friday um, because Christian universities in the States for 200 years will set one day apart to pray that God would pour out his spirit on these universities. And on the 200th anniversary of this prayer day, it's held at Asbury after the Spirit of God pours his spirit out on these kids. So he's going to explain a little bit about what went on, Ramon. On February 8th, right here, 
Our regularly scheduled chapel service never ended. And in addition to students here, in addition to students across the street, colleges and universities representing over 200 schools, students flocking in from all over the country have joined with us over the last couple of weeks. And other guests have come from every region of the United States and even from pockets from the world. And I just wanna say, this was not planned. This was not a function of an innovative state-of-the-art facility. It was not a function of a slick marketing scheme. There was no program planning committee. And it's not because of celebrities or professional musicians. This has been a nameless, titleless movement, and tonight will be no different. So many, so many have humbly endeavored to consistently elevate Jesus Christ as the focal point. And the atmosphere and the spirit of this space is reminiscent of those characteristics we see in James chapter 3. Pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, full of fruit. No partiality, no hypocrisy. And consistent with other stories, I am a first-hand witness of radical humility, of humanizing compassion, raw confession and honesty, a self-emptying consecration and life-altering commitment. What started with students has, over just a couple of weeks, swelled to thousands upon thousands of hungry-hearted guests. So this, um, this chapel service just continued, and it was, as they said, like this super low-key, unhyped thing. Like um, John Tyson in his message last week from his church in, in New York, he'd, he'd jumped in the car and gone down there. And he's like, I could have done with a little more hype, like maybe like two, like something. <laughs> he said it was embarrassingly low-key. <laughs> You know, piano, acoustic guitar. It's probably like us, actually. You know, and it's like um, just and, and all these celebrity worship pastors try, you know, turn up and they got told no, we don't need you. And it's just these kids leading worship for hours and prayer and testimonies and like this outpouring of the spirit. This total, as the guy said, lack of ego. And I've been tuning in and I've just been like just so moved by just seeing the beauty of it. Um, all about Jesus and watching these. And, and the thing that again fills me with hope is I went on the little ramp before around we need people to step up and just to give their lives to the kingdom. This is what happens when God starts moving. So I'm like, out of all of these kids that have just met Jesus in this very profound way, that's got a significant long-term impact for the church and for the kingdom of God. That's where you get called to, to give your life away to Jesus, those moments of encounter. And so... Uh, it's super significant. Um, I had the great privilege this week, and name dropping hard out, but I got to chat with John Tyson this week on Zoom with a couple of other pastor mates of mine, and um, just and we were just asking him about this whole thing, trying to discern what's going on, and he's like, "This is significant." He's like, "This is the this isn't the main thing. This is the tremor. This is the beginning of something." And but you know the thing that's um, uh, super kind of the whole heart of it is actually that it's all about those young people. Like that move of God was for Gen, it's for Gen Z. It's for those younger guys. And that's why they guarded the stage a whole lot and they just made sure that it was all about them and it was all about Jesus and what he was doing in their lives, which is super important. So here's, here's what my conviction is with the cyclone thing, with Asbury coming uh, uh, alongside that. And I know that most of you guys have been just all tied up in cyclone stuff, but, it, but I've had eyes on both. Here's what I think God's wanting to do uh, throughout the church, and I'm praying that this is something for, for um, not just Bay Vineyard, but for our nation. We've had this massive disruption here in the Bay, but we've also had the first genuine move of God in the Western church in over 30 years. And here's, here's the number one thing that I'm like, I think we've got to do in terms of responding to this, and it's this, pray. Pray. 
So here's what I mean by that. In the same way we've had this natural desire to go and do something to help this region recover, the Lord's been reminding me that we have the greatest tool available to us to unleash blessing and healing over our region, and that is prayer. And God is working for good and stirring up a a fresh love for this region. And we need to channel that love into long-term prayer. Here's the tragedy, and I felt the Lord convict me of that this week. The tragedy is that many Christians think that they can do more with the shovel than they can do on their knees in prayer to help this region. Is that true? That deep down we think that we can actually do more practically than prayer? Like, I think we struggle deeply with agnosticism when it comes to prayer. Does it actually do anything? But I tell you what, this Asbury thing, that's encouraging. That God hears and answers prayer. And so I think we've got to deal with our agnostic prayer tendencies and actually come to this faith that God hears and answers prayer and that prayer is our greatest weapon and that prayer works. Zand in his Lenten reflection yesterday says this, As we continue in our Christian life, we may experience disappointments in prayer that we slip then into praying safe prayers, prayers that never risk disappointment. We no longer pray boldly like Bartimaeus, instead we pray careful prayers. Prayers that are so vague and ambiguous that we would be hard-pressed to tell whether or not they have ever been answered. I understand this inclination and there have been times in my own life when I've slept into praying this way. But if we never actually ask Jesus to specifically and definably intervene in our life, though we may shield ourselves from disappointment, we also preclude the possibility of experiencing a miracle. So I'm like, man, I just feel this thing as a lot of this love for this region and like all this epic stuff happening in terms of people helping and serving. And I felt the Lord say, like, like turn this into a deep commitment to pray for this region, <laughs> to, to pray God's blessing over this region, God's healing over this region, but is supremely praying that God would pour out his spirit on this region. And Lord, if you can do it in that university in Asbury, you can do it in this place. And so what if we just spend the next 10 years contending in prayer that God would pour out his spirit for this place? What if that's the thing that starts happening? What if, uh, you know, what if we... Again, this is the thing that's wrecked me on this Asbury thing. It's like what the Asbury thing I think is meant to help do in most of us is give us a heart for Gen Z, for that, those under 25s. And again, what's the best thing that we can do for them? It's pray for them. And so out of this, I'm like, you've got the cycling, you've got Asbury. I'm like, let's pray for our region and let's pray for these under 25s. But let's not just like have some vague thing. Let's go for it. Let's really go for it as a church and not short term either. Like we've been praying faithfully now for four years at our prayer meeting for God to pour out his spirit in the bay for all the normal things. And I'm like, let's crank it up. Let's crank it up. And like perhaps the best thing we could do is pray. And maybe actually what God's wanting to do is break our heart for the under 25s and the world that they're growing up in. And rather than just go, oh, no, what can we do? Like, how are they going to survive this? We could pray our little boots off so that they encounter the Spirit of God like their kids are doing in Asbury. Tyson wrote this in his email uh, this week that he writes to, to fathers, and it's worth everyone's getting on. It's brilliant. He's like this, for Gen Z, nothing we've tried has worked. And he said earlier, like, we've tried counselling, we've got all this sort of stuff. We've got the anxiety rates and depression rates. And they're gro- here's the thing with Gen Z is that we've grown up in this culture, but we're all like frogs in the pan where the water's slowly got hotter and hotter and hotter. And we just haven't really noticed how crazy and toxic it is. Occasionally we do. This is the world our children are growing up in. It's a different world than I grew up in. It's so intense. Anxiety's everywhere. Depression's everywhere. Like, it's so full on. And so I'm like, John, so Tyson says for John Z, Gen Z, nothing will try to work. Maybe it's time we try tears. <laughs> Ask for tears for your children growing up in a godless world. Ask for tears for a generation plagued with anxiety. Ask for tears for the struggling, staggering rates of depression and suicide. Ask for tears for a bride whose garments are defined by spots and blemishes. The thing about this revival is that this is where God, of course, he was going to do it, not through some megachurch. He was going to do it through this horrible looking Baptist chapel. 
They had no lights and no screens and just had a couple of acoustic guitars and a piano. Of course, that's what he's going to pick because people are cynical about all that razzmatazz, that generation, and rightly so. We've tried to manipulate the Holy Spirit. When he's sovereign, we don't hype him up. He comes down. Ask for tears for the slow decay, stealing the light and joy out of these kids. And so here's, here's the thing. Like, I felt so, so, like, I felt for the, like I felt this burden for Gen Z, and it's the first time I felt it properly. Like the Lord is just, has, for you guys, like honestly, I'm feeling it. And I'm like, what can we do as a church? And then like the region, you feel it, the groan. What can we do? Guys, we've got to believe in the power of prayer that God hears and answers prayer. And here's the mentality that I'm, I reckon we've got to have. What if we spent... Like, I'm, I just turned 40 last year. What if I just spent the next 40 years of my life praying for renewal in the bay and for the, kid, for, for the under-25s? What if I just spent the next 40 years doing that? That would be a good investment in my time. And what if I am sowing seeds that where one day a tree will grow of which the shade I will never experience myself, but it will bless future generations? I'm like, I just want to do it. I feel like that's what he's want to stir up within us. So here's the thing with our prayer meeting. We've had a faithful core that have prayed at that prayer meeting now for years. But here's the invitation of God in this season, is that our whole church would be the faithful core. We we move from the 10 or 15 people that come to our prayer meeting, and as a church, we commit out of this revival that's happening and out of out of the cyclone thing that we're going to become a culture of prayer and we're going to crank that right up. We're going to accelerate that bad boy big time. So the dream is that we'd have this prayer-soaked culture. The dream is passionate and faithful prayer out of this. And there's something happening in prayer that is significant. Tyson, again, to quote him, um, he's significant in this whole thing at the moment. Next slide, thanks, Ramon. He posted this week, this was their prayer meeting three years ago in New York City. This was their prayer week, their same meeting this week on Monday, Monday night. How cool is that? Three years. It's gone from a handful of people praying in a room to hundreds in a room crying out for God, for their city, for the under 25s. That's cool. I'm like, Lord, daughter, bay vineyard. Daughter, bay vineyard. So what does it look like for, look, at the end of the day, I feel so strongly about this, but I can't make you do it. <laughs> Love to. Can't make you do it. Best I can do is do my best preach I can possibly do. But it's the Spirit of God that seals something in your heart where you get a conviction that this isn't Sam's good talk. This is God standing before you, inviting you to have his heart and to get on your knees to seek his face for this region and for the next generation. That's the work of the Spirit. But if you like, yeah, um, again, talking to Tyson, he's like, man, our church is not ready for God to move. He's talking about his church. He's like, most of our guys don't know how to deliver someone, lead someone in confession, lead someone to the Lord. People feel a little wonky about even praying for each other. And I'm like, yep, <laughs> probably our guys as well. You know, not everyone. Again, we're like, this is, Tyson's read on this whole thing is this is, there, this is here to, um, to help us build capacity, kingdom capacity. So I'm like, you know, prayer meetings aren't easy to go to. Church isn't easy to go to. There's a battle on every time. Some of you guys went through it this morning. Real, you chose to come here. Well done. And we battle. Some of you guys don't turn up for months. How are we going to see the see the God's kingdom come? You know, come come once a month or whatever. It's like this is crazy. We're, we we're going to get passionate about this thing as the hope of the world. It's like Jesus' bride, His kingdom. And so when that starts happening. Uh, Passion looks like reordering your life so that these priorities are there in place. Uh, they look like building capacity and learning and being committed to grow so that we can be people that can steward what God wants to do in this region. It's not a short-term thing. It's years, right? And it's not on you. It's on me, <laughs> mostly. I've got to like, we've got to sit down with our team and go, how can we, how can we re reverse engineer this? If in five years' time people know how to do deliverance, how to do confession, how to pray for one another, and are consistent in their private life of prayer and then committed to the corporate life of our prayer, like how do we do that? So we're going to have to work out how we do that, right? But we're going to do it. <laughs> I'm deeply committed to this because what Asbury's doing in hearts of pastors is stirring hope that he's on the move. Aslan's on the move. 
He's on the move again. So how do you do it? So I'm like, you've got to reorder the priorities of your life. And like tonight we've got our prayer meeting. And I don't want to hear, yeah, Sunday nights don't really work for me. Well, Sunday night, like, it's a little bit too far to travel. I'm like, he died on a cross and we can't travel 30 minutes to get to Napier for our prayer meeting? <laughs> like, come on, church. I think it's a, you know, like, for, uh, I'm t- like, trust me, do I want it? Sunday night isn't a great night for me up front. I'm tired. I pack in every single Sunday and out every single Sunday and then all the rest of it. I'm tired by the time I get home. I love it, but I'm tired. I could do with a quiet night. So it's like we reorder our lives. Nap. Me and Jen take turns having a little nap. We've got some amazing in-laws that help with our kids so we can get to the prayer meeting. And here's the thing. We get to the prayer meeting because if I don't get to the prayer meeting, most of the time I'm praying prayers of comfort for myself, not prayers of contending for this region. But I get in that environment, I'm praying prayers of contending. How many, how many of your prayers are actually prayers of contending rather than prayers of discomfort for you? So this is why I'm like, there is an awakening happening, friends, and God is standing before you today to ask that your heart would feel it. A love for this region, a love for the kingdom of God, but I reckon one of the biggest things is a heart for the, that, that younger generation. And so here's my invitation, that you would join the groan. Join the groan and come to our prayer meeting. And, you know, uh, again, Church of the City have gone from like one average prayer meeting to 21 prayer meetings every single week. And then you're wondering why, like, stuff's happening. Like, stuff's happening. It's like, oh, man. People are getting raised up. Leaders are emerging. Like, that's New York City. That's like tough, cynical, secular ground, man. He can do it in New York. He can do it in the Bay. Tough place still. I'm like, where does it begin? It begins on our knees in prayer. So I'm like, out of the cyclone and out of Asbury, I'm like, let's commit to building a prayer culture here, friends. And let's like, let's go, I'm gonna be, I'm going to, I'm going to be part of this whole thing. Now I've tried my best to put into words the burning of my heart. And I'm sorry if I've sounded cross once or twice. Everyone's had a tough couple of weeks. So sorry that there's a few heavy things I said in that talk there. I'm like, I wish I'd sent that more gently, but that's okay. Um, but I hope you're hearing what God's saying to us. And, uh, and I want to invite us this morning to just wrestle with what this means for us. Because here's what I've been trying to do this morning. We're, we're living through the cyclone. This is as breathing heavy. I'm like, let's just get some elevation and see what God's doing from it from big picture, because the danger is we can just go through week to week, day to day, and, and actually we don't see what God's doing. But I'm like, here's what I think God's doing. How can we bless it? And so, friends, we're putting some energy into our prayer meeting. As I said, we're going to have worship there every week from now on, live worship. And uh, me and Blair have been talking about just tweaking how, how we run it, um, and we're going to form a little team that oversees some of the prayer culture in our church with some of these people. But I just want to invite you to um, wrestle and sit with God around what this could mean for you. So, you know, Ryan's committed for a long time now. I'm going to be there fortnightly. So, again, I'm not asking you to, as I even think, just like just some sort of engagement. I'm going to go there monthly. I'm going to go there fortnightly with some people out of this meeting. I'm going to be there weekly. And then let's just see what God does. Because the other thing we need is a building. And a big part of the reason we need a building is because we want to have a prayer a place of prayer so we can start having more of these corporate prayer meetings and we can start dialing this up uh, because here's the thing you know uh, for the, it's for these guys it's for the Gen Z <laughs> it's for these guys that we want to do this because the prayer that I'm going to be praying is that there'll be moments in our youth group as it emerges that the Holy Spirit's poured out in the same way they saw it poured out in Asbury and I'm going to be praying for that and praying for that and praying for that on this prayer meeting. And we're going to be praying prayers of renewal and blessing over this land at every single one of our prayer meetings. We're going to be just, we're going to get a lot more intentional around that. And, um, and I just, I'm filled with faith around what, God, what God's going to do in and through our church as we commit to prayer. That's the response I think we have to have out of the cyclone and out of what's happening as we get on our knees as a church and say, we're seeking your face, God. Was seeking your face. Amen.